So, faced with the question, where did they go next with this podcast? The guys were recently joined by legendary musical genius Bruce Dickerson, who's agreed to be the new producer of the Stack and Benjamin show. They were all excited to meet him. Hey, fellas, I'm Bruce Dickerson. Yes, the Bruce Dickerson. You have a dynamite sound, fantastic sound. I have only one suggestion. More cowbell. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today, because mom's getting stir-crazy, we're celebrating fizzy bubbles. That's right, Coke was invented on today's date, and to celebrate, we're going to talk about all the real estate that Coca-Cola companies accumulated across the globe to distribute this behemoth. Wait, what? We don't have anything ready for that? I told you guys like an hour ago. Plenty of time. Just go with real estate? Yeah, all right, fine. We'll go with real estate. We'll run with it. <clears throat> All right, sorry for the delay. Uh, where were we? Uh, oh, yeah, today, good news, we're talking real estate. Yeah, and to help out, please welcome the co-host of the brand spanking new podcast, Real Estate Rookie, Felipe Mejia. And no stranger to real estate herself, say hello to Afford Anything's Paula Pant. And the guy with the best underground real estate in Los Angeles from LenPenzo.com. Believe it or not, it's... Oh, God, not again. It's Len Penzo. Jeez. All right, plus, in our Evil HR Lady segment, we'll talk to the Evil HR Lady herself, Suzanne Lucas, about those work-from-home Zoom calls. Maybe you should rethink how you show up for those. Of course, we'll also magnify someone's money question, and I'll dazzle you with some fizzy cola-flavored trivia. And now, a guy who thinks crushing it means guzzling a bottle of Orange Crush. It's Joe Saul Seahawk. That isn't what it means. It must be my mistake. Hey, welcome to Soft Drinks for the Win podcast. I'm Joe Saul Seahawk, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And what a show do we have today because coming to us from his new oil storage facility deep under Los Angeles, it's Mr. Len Penzo. You're hoarding this stuff now, aren't you? Have you seen the price of this of this stuff lately? Crude. I mean, they're paying you to to keep it. I mean, of course, I'd be stupid not to. I'm swimming in it right now. Yeah, you're making so much. Literally, you've got your hot tub full of crude, don't you? Light sweet crude. It is the bomb. The only thing better than light sweet crude is Coca Cola. I am one of those huge Coca Cola fans. I'm I'm a Coca Cola snob. Actually, I'm one of those people. If they say Coke or Pepsi, and they'll say no, we only have Pepsi, and I'll just say forget it. Have I'll you? have water. Have you, you're that guy that, uh, Lewis Black jokes about you familiar with comedian Lewis Black? No. Lewis Black has a great joke where he's like, you say Coke at the restaurant, they say Pepsi. And you're the guy that goes, I'm not drinking that. I, I, absolutely right. I'll say, may I'll have a water, please. Wow. <laughs> or a beer or whatever. Yeah. You are a snob. I am a snob. Yes. And the woman who is a coronavirus snob, she only gets it if it's going to be like 103 degree temperature. It's Paula Pant. Exactly. If I'm going to get a virus, it's only going to be the best types <laughs> of virus to get. <laughs> I'm going to get the one that goes to the edge. <laughs> yes. But Len, have you ever been to the Coca-Cola Museum in Atlanta? No, but you know what? That would be awesome to go to. I will have to try it. Next time I'm in Atlanta, I will check it out. I, I had, when I lived in Atlanta, I had an annual pass to that museum. And so it, I could go so as many that? times as I wanted over the span of a year. I still only How went big once. is it? How big is it? Uh, it's, a, it's a decent size. And at the very end, they have a tasting room where you can taste various Coca-Colas and Coca-Cola products from around the world. So you can see what it tastes like in Eastern Europe versus South America versus Southeast Asia. Excellent. Well, you know, and it, do, it is different from place to place, right? Because I know because I get Mexican Cokes here in L.A. Mm -hmm. and they're made. They're totally different than oh. the ones made in America. Exactly. Because they're made with real cane sugar. Fantastic. Exactly. Yes. I'll take that Coca-Cola every time. Yep. And the guy who's wondering if he's on the wrong podcast, he thought we were going to talk about some real estate today. But instead, it's all Coca-Cola. <laughs> 
Felipe Mejia is here with us. How are you, man? I'm good, brother. How are you? Thanks for having me on. <laughs> Were you checking everything and going, I, I think I'm in the wrong place? I sat down and I was like, wait a minute, this does not look familiar. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's really interesting. Paula talking about the Coca-Cola, I've actually been there and I could only do three different flavors. By the time I got to the fourth flavor, I was like, oh, OK, I'm sick of this. But I could see how Paula could take advantage of it by going back different days and trying like different parts of the country's Coke. <laughs> <laughs> Paula brings a flask with her when she goes to the Coca-Cola oh <laughs> Museum. Yes. She oh, she has the other flavor. So congratulations on the launch, man. It's always exciting finding uh, uh, somebody that has a, a podcast, especially somebody with a podcast like yours, Felipe, where you're helping out a lot of people that uh, just getting into the real estate industry. Tell everybody what you do. Sure, man. So it's interesting because in this show, we talk to other rookies, right? Because you can Google real estate how-to podcast and you're going to find – Joe Schmo that has a million properties. Like you're not going to hear somebody interviewed who's a firefighter and his wife's a nurse and they have three rentals, right? And they're just trying to make a little bit extra on top and trying to secure some long, you know, a little bit more money. You just don't find those podcasts. So what Bigger Pockets did was we created a podcast for rookies, basically by rookies. I only have eight rentals myself. And then my co-host, I believe has maybe 13 or 14 you know, we don't have like huge apartment complexes or anything where we've been in the game just long enough to be able to hold our own, but still remember the days of trying to get one rental property. And that's what this podcast is all about. It's about creating a community of rookies and saying, hey, this is how we got our fifth or sixth property. You're buying your first. We're going to be able to show you how to do that by interviewing others who are doing the same thing as well. Yeah. And you're I, a huge mogul or whatever. Yeah. And I love your story too, which, uh, I mean, I'd like you to tell just a little bit of that because sure. you're a guy too, that doesn't come from a, you don't come from a background of, you know, dad handed you 10 real estate properties and said, let's shrink it to eight. No, by no means, man. So basically I grew up in a mobile home most of my life. And then we eventually did end up buying a house and in the Latin culture, if you will, you know, my family, most of the bread was coming in by my dad, right? The money was coming in by dad. My mom stayed home and took care of the kids, took care of us. And then when I turned uh, between 11 and 12, sometime my dad bounced and, you know, went back to Mexico, had a whole nother different family. And my mom was stuck with not only not a lot of job experience, but now a mortgage payment. And what she did was she ended up house hacking is the term we use. But basically she built with the last $10,000 she had, she built three bedrooms downstairs, no codes, none of that, just basically stick in and drywall and rented it out to anybody that would rent. And that's how we kind of stayed afloat. And I saw the power of real estate then and there. I tell the story that I was never poor in quotations, if you will, but we always felt the water at our throat, never drowned. But I mean, we could always feel it right at our throat. And real estate gave us just down to our shoulders, maybe, right? Just a little bit more breathing room. And that's when it really like clicked the power of real estate. That's fabulous. And are you 30 yet? Uh, 29. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> I know. Len and I also, we're all 29. You look great. Yes. Yes. And if you want to hear more far fetched stories, you know where you go for that, Felipe? You head to the Stacker, which is our newsletter. There you uh, go. Head to head to com forward slash stacker. And not only will you get a bunch of uh, great money tips every week, but you will also find out what's happening here in the basement from time to time. So I'm sure Felipe wrote that down because exactly. Yep. <laughs> got it. We got a great show here. We got Felipe. We've got Paula. We've got Len bathing and light crude. So let's get the party started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Today's piece we're going to talk about comes from a friend of ours, Coach Carson, Chad Carson, the Coach Carson blog. It's a piece called My Top Three Lessons from a 51-Year-Old Real Estate Investing Pro, a guy named uh, Pete Fortunato. I picked this piece because I like a lot of lessons in here. Whether you're interested in, in real estate or not, he's got three big lessons. and We're just going to take them for everybody one by one. And the first thing is... He says in lesson number one that commerce is about people. Len, you're a guy who, before all this stuff happened, was going to retire this year, right? <laughs> yeah. how, how much of your career has been about what you know and how much of it has been about people? 
a lot of it has been about people, Joe. And let me let me tell you something. Even all of most ninety percent of my opportun job opportunities have always come through who I knew. Who I knew. It's the networks I built, the people I've met, and you know the the work that I've done with them and building those relationships. If I didn't build those relationships with those people, a lot of those opportunities I would have never had. And I am just a huge believer in that. That's why it's so important to network. And Felipe, they talk, especially in real estate that you're in, is half the battle is building that team of people that you can trust. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I think relationships are crucial and something that uh, when I was younger, I didn't see the value or power in. And not only is it who you know, but it's also using the people you know in a positive way and not building relationships to see what you can get from it, but building relationships for for the sole purpose of, of of building relationships, I feel like at times a lot of people will build a relationship to see what they can get from somebody, and yeah. that's never going to work out. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And Paula, you're somebody who has a wide network. How did you go about building your team? Uh, do you mean in real estate, or do you mean through the afford anything? Well, actually, for both, because I'm sure you've got a team of people you worked on in real estate, but also just for your connections for the blog and the podcast. So the reason I ask that clarifying question is because my approach was a little bit different for each of those two. So with afford anything, because it's a blog and a podcast, so many people in the personal finance, blogging and podcasting space work digitally. And so a lot of the initial relationships that I made started through email communication, started like it began as a digital relationship. And then it was by going to conferences that I would meet people who I've already established a digital relationship with in the past. So then meeting face to face would solidify what had, you know, for several months been an online relationship that we'd been building. So that's how I've done that with Afford Anything. But with real estate, it was different because so much of that is the people who need to be boots on the ground, the contractors, the property manager, they are local. And so a lot of that was finding one person, one person who just lives in that area, who could then facilitate those introductions. It's interesting, Felipe, to talk about what Paula's saying. You know, my wife, Cheryl, and my son, Nick, are buying some real estate together. And in real estate, you know better than I do. People will tell you anything. So let's get kind of real estate specific. Like when you're building that team, whether it's a general contractor or somebody, electrician, whatever it might be, how do you kind of look through the smoke screen to see beyond that to who the right people will be to help you with a project? I'm going to give two spectrums here. I look for the right contractor by literally going, if, if I don't have any connections in that city, I'll go to the closest Home Depot at the hour that they open and the first three contractors there when the doors open are going to be typically the guys that I want to hire. They weren't out drunk last night. They weren't out spending the money last night that, uh, you know, that, <laughs> that another client had paid them. And, and they're there bright and early. So I know that they probably have a meeting and then they have to get to the job site by nine or 10 o'clock because that's what I did before I started real estate. I knew that I had a meeting. I had to meet with a different client and I had to pick up material. So I was going to be at Home Depot at six, seven in the morning. So if you're going to go somewhere and you have no idea and you don't have any connections in that city, that's how I would find great contractors. Another way that I look through the smoke is I ask contractors if I can meet them on a certain job site. If one, if they say they don't, they're not on a job site now, probably not going to hire them. But if they say, yeah, you can definitely come out to the job site. I can see the job. I can see the client that they're working with and everything is going smooth. That's another good flag for me. A red flag would be if they don't. And then the last thing that I also do is I tell the contractor, hey, can you come out to my job? Let's look through it. And if they automatically ask me for payment up front before they even get started, definitely a red flag, someone I'm not going to hire. Contractors should have money in reserves to start a project. So those are three big things that I use to look through the smoke for contractors. Man, that's great stuff. Lesson two on this list is use multiple currencies to solve problems. And I really like this, Len. He starts off by saying, I see my primary real estate investor role as a creative problem solver. So I love that Pete, his mentor in this piece, emphasizes being creative and stepping outside of artificial boxes and limitations created by our society, our industry, and our own minds. The key paradigm Pete taught is the concept of currencies. We all know the most popular currency, money. What we call money is just a piece of paper printed with fancy green ink by the Federal Reserve Bank. Are the fancy green pieces of paper what we really want? Pete told a funny story. Basically, Pete says, 
There's lots of different types of currencies. I'll help you with this. You help me with something else, right? I can pay you in, there's all kinds of different currencies out there. That kind of gives me some hope, Len, for some of the younger people listening, that even if you don't have a lot of cash, there's ways to get started in real estate and investing and learning what the heck you're doing. Sure. You just got to get clever, right? So let me just, I mean, there's, there's always alternatives to everything. Let's, for example, I was uh, talking with um, one of uh, one of my blog readers talking about investing and about talking about the, the threats of inflation, and they were worried about inflation hedges. One of the things I said, they said they didn't have a lot of money, and I said, well, you know, it's something that's an interesting inflation hedge that most people don't think of is food. If you can't afford, say, something really big, maybe you, you don't have a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars to put a, put away in a big investment. Start buying cans of food because if this is if you think inflation's coming down the road, canned food lasts a long time, and by buying that now at a cheaper price, you're actually earning a return. So that it's an, uh, just an, it's another alternative that's out of the box that you might never think of. So or start storing oil. In or your hot storing tub, storing oil in your bunker. That's another absolutely that <laughs> yes. works too. It's a, me- it's a lot messier, but that's, that's the currency right there. Uh, Paula, he talks about himself being a deal maker, and I think often well, we don't think of ourselves as a deal maker as as often as we should, or a problem solver, where we're trying to help other people solve problems so that ours gets solved. Yeah, exactly. So I, I teach an online course about rental property investing, and one thing that I have the students do is take this quiz to find out what their personality style is, because there are some people who are naturally deal makers, like they like bringing people together. They like the process of thinking creatively and negotiating and and trying to figure out, like, what does each party actually want? You know, because it's not just about money. Sometimes it might be about a quick sale. It might be about, you know, reducing frustrations and inconveniences. Like there are all of these factors that are relatively important to to both people on both sides of the transaction. And so people who have a personality, like typically a little bit more extroverted, a little bit more um, likes to think creatively, uh, likes to think on their feet, you know, those are the deal maker types of people, but, but not everybody is like that. And so like some of the other personality styles um, that people have, you know, if they're like the data scientist and what they really love is, digging into numbers and they're introverted and they'd rather be behind a spreadsheet, you know, like yeah. then deal making with a for sale by owner on seller financing, like that might just not suit their personality. And so depending on your, your own personal skill set, your personality, that I think that will also inform the way in which you approach this. Well, and to that point, here's what I wonder from you, Felipe, is that I started as a financial planner when I was 27 And uh, I remember people telling me at that time, they'd say, how old are you? Is the first question. And I can't imagine some of these seasoned people working in real estate. Is it harder being 29 and being a deal maker than if you were 45? Yes, it plays a part. But I think a lot of people will say, oh, well, you started working at 18 or 19. See, I started working when I was 14 on the construction sites, cleaning construction sites to start making money. And then I started doing flooring and then I started a moving company. All three of my companies have been six figures plus. So by the time I was 25, I had tons of experience. I graduated college and I I graduated college also in three years because I knew how much debt college would occur. I also paid for college cash. So I've done all of this in a very short time. And and, and I think a lot of times once people get to know you and get to know who you are, it's a little different than just saying, you know, how old are you? The question should be, how much experience do you have? What have you been doing? I know some very smart 26-year-olds, and I know some very dumb 55-year-olds, right? (laughs) So I think it's more about the experience and and what you've done, right? It has to say something that that at my age before 30, I've accumulated over 60 tenants that even during this, this time, I don't have any vacancies. My properties run very, very well. It looks like you're about to ask me a question, so go ahead. Well, no, I'm just wondering, as you're talking then, would you recommend that somebody who's getting into real estate, they learn how to fix toilets, kind of the basics of how to do wiring or put in insulation or or remodel work, so that when they're talking to the contractors, because it seems to me that that even at 29, because you've got so much experience, you're able to talk their language, and that, based on what you're telling me, that seems to be the important part. 
Yeah, that's right. And speaking somebody's language doesn't mean they speak English to English or Spanish to Spanish. I think speaking someone's language is something that you can understand. And that goes far more than just language. But yes. earlier, like Len said, it's about building those relationships, right? So when I was on the construction site, I knew what the what the framers did, what the electrician did. So I would tell someone getting into real estate, don't learn everything. Know a little bit about everything, just enough to be able to have a conversation. If the electrician comes in and says, hey, you need a 24 volt here or this, that, or that wire here or this, that, or that, you know, be able to hold your own with that person and you're going to earn that person's respect. If they just come in and tell you, you need this, this, and this, and you're like, okay, well, how much is it? Then they're not going to feel like you care about their work. I think a lot of the times, even plumbers care about their work. Electricians care about their work. So I would tell a new investor, no, don't learn every trade, but learn enough to hold your own, to be able to have an educated conversation with someone that's going to do work on your property. Yeah. And I definitely wasn't talking about language barrier. I was talking about yeah. barrier between, you know, like on the old, uh, <laughs> Felipe might be young enough. He might not even know this reference, but, but Len, do you remember the movie, Mr. Mom? When he's, when, yes. <laughs> when, when he's, when he's pretending he's working on the electricity and the guy comes in and goes, Oh, is that two twenty? And he goes two twenty or two twenty one, whatever it takes. Like, whatever it takes. Well, yeah. Like that's not talking the same language. If he says two twenty, I got to know what the hell he's talking about. And that Felipe is what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Just showing the respect of somebody's work goes a long way. Just knowing a little bit of their knowledge and saying, oh, you know, I, I know a little bit. That's cool. And, and then you start building that rapport with that person. Then you start building your team. Because if you're going to buy more than one rental property, you're going to use an electrician again. You're going to use an HVAC person again. Uh, the third lesson that uh, Chad has here is don't forget why you do this which it's funny. I was listening to the interview you did with our friends, uh, Brandon, David over at bigger pockets. And you were talking about whenever you do, uh, and let me make sure I got this right. Whenever you do a flip, you do that to subsidize your next rental house. So you've got this longer term plan that you're working toward. Yeah. So I always get the question, Hey, Felipe, how do you get the 20% down payment for your property? And you know, now it's actually Chase Bank is asking for 30%. So it's getting crazy out there. But you know, how do I get that money? It's like, do you go out and work for it? And I was, I would say, yes, a lot of the times I would. But I've realized that I can flip a property and use those profits to buy a rental property. Now, I am going to pay taxes on that. Uh, you can't 1031 exchange a, a, a fix and flip. So that's unfortunate, but I do use the proceeds to buy my next rental property. And then even from there, I go as far as paying off a property in cash, getting a line of credit on it and using that money to buy more rental property. It's not as sexy because I don't get a check to post on Instagram, but I'm able to reuse the same money over and over again. Yeah, that's great. Paula, on a bigger, bigger level, there's also, don't forget why you do this in the first place, right? I mean, people can get so obsessed with the task that they never use it for any bigger picture. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the reason that we're doing any of this, the reason that people, you know, whether it's investing in the stock market or investing in real estate, the idea is to have financial security and build wealth so that you can live in the way that you want to live. And sometimes it can be so easy to get caught up in the numbers that you forget what purpose your money is trying to serve. Like if you want, if there's a decision that would significantly improve your life, but it's going to cost a lot more money and you have that money then at a certain point, you have to be okay with the fact that you are going to spend extra. Len, when you were busy working for the man, you know, there's, there's lots of, and you're still busy working for the man. Mm -hmm. There's got to be lots of times where people want extra hours from you. They want extra stuff from you. And you got to remind yourself why you're doing it. Yeah. You know, and I was thinking on this one specifically, don't forget, it's really important, especially for those, this is a, a non real estate example. For any career, you have to remember, you have to know why you're in your career and what you want to do. I, for a long time, I was really going, my goal was I want to get to the top. I want to be CEO of, you know, of the company. And then after a while, I realized, you know what, as I got higher up the chain, I was like, these guys are working there, you know, way more hours. My bosses were working way more hours than I wanted to put in. And it would be taking away from my family. And so I had to make a decision. Why, you know, why am I working? And I, and my decision was, I want working for, I don't want to work for the company. I don't want to give my life 24 seven to the company. I have a family. And so I wanted to scale back. And so I kept that in mind. And that once I realized that it made my work career so much nicer because I knew exactly, Hey, I don't want to go all the way to the top. You know, I want to stop at this. I got to the level I was happy with and I stayed there and I just excelled at that position. And it was a good work balance, good work-life balance. 
Yeah. And if you're thinking about somebody at the beginning of their career or like talking about this specific piece, somebody starting out in real estate of these three lessons that Chad goes over here, Len, what, what do you think is the biggest takeaway? Of all three lessons, which one's the most important? Yeah. Oh, that's so hard. You know what? I'm going to have to go with the uh, the last one. Don't forget why you're doing what you're doing. Because if you don't know that, then all the other ones don't even make a hill of beans a difference. Paula? Yeah, I would say that it's all about relationships. If you focus first on people, the rest of the business works better in the long run. Yeah, that, that one was the biggest for me. Although I love what Len's talking about as well. Felipe, you've got the last word. Biggest takeaway? Honestly, I think my biggest takeaway is I'm going to steal what, what Len said. If you don't know why you're doing it, you know, the first time you get hit in the mouth, you're going to quit and, and you're going to get hit in the mouth in real estate. And if you don't have a why bigger than yourself, then you're going to quit and you're not going to do it. The first time the plumbing goes out, the AC goes out, you're going to be like, oh, this is trash. So you have to know your why and you have to pursue that. Suzanne Lucas is the evil HR lady and coming up now we're going to talk about those zoom meeting calls you've been on it's a whole new world and some people sadly don't understand it well Suzanne writes for Inc magazine also has evilhrlady.org let's say hello to her right now not on a zoom call but on my dad shortwave Suzanne Lucas And joining us on my dad shortwave, it's our good friend Suzanne Lucas, the evil HR lady back. Hey, I'm happy to be here. I'm I'm so happy that you're here with us. You know, everybody, Suzanne, is doing these Zoom call meetings now. You and I have both seen some hilarious memes. I think half the world saw the one with the woman that didn't realize her video was on and took the uh took the phone to the bathroom. That was a big one. But you wrote a piece for Inc. and it also appears on your site. We'll link to it on our show notes page. A judge's request highlights why you need a telecommuting dress code. Tell me what you wrote about here, because this will kick off a great discussion, I think. Well, the judge in, in Florida, because of course it was Florida, where else would it be? Of course. Um, <laughs> he um, said that he had people showing up for attorneys, attorneys. These were not, you know, clients. These were attorneys showing up for court virtual court on camera. He said um, one was shirtless, a male shirtless lawyer. Another was a woman in bed in her pajamas. And then a third in a swimsuit with like a little cover up over. And he said, you know, if you're, it's court, it's still court and you need to dress appropriately. Sometimes I think we can get too casual when we're all at home. I yeah. saw this really, there's a really dumb show on Netflix. I think it's called a hundred humans. I don't recommend it, but they do these, uh, <laughs> it's awful, but they do these, these, uh, non-scientific studies with these hundred people where they put them through all kinds of weird testing. But one of the things that they tested that has to do with this, they made up stories about people and, uh, said that they were criminals and one person was classically, quote, good looking, and the other person wasn't, was kind of what they would classically say was just middle of the road, like most of us, right? The good looking people in their non-scientific study always got off lighter, like the people, the people that were going to give them a sentence, let them off lighter. And it always seems like people who dress the part, people who try a little bit, get a better sentence. Why would somebody show up at court in a bathing suit? Well, can you imagine if you were the client <laughs> yeah, right. and your attorney <laughs> is there, I would flip my lid. And, you know, I, I wrote this and, and every time I write about dress codes, I get emails saying that how dumb I am because we should judge people by their performance and not by their dress code, but by what they're wearing. And Yes, you should judge people by your performance, but actually how you dress is part of your performance. It's communication. That's why we dress the way we do, is to communicate to others. When we go to a football game, what do we wear? We wear the colors from the team that we're supporting. We're communicating. 
when we go to court, theoretically, we wear a suit because we want to communicate, I am professional, I am trustworthy, blah, blah, blah. When you go to Burger King, they're wearing a uniform, so you know who is who. It's all this part of communication. So I don't have a lot of sympathy for people that are like, oh, it's just performance. Yes, but it is communicating something to it. And people will say, well, yeah, but you know, Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg is also communicating something with his uniform that he, he wears, you know, he was trying to communicate. I'm the cool, casual tech guy, but you know what he wore when he testified before Congress? A suit. A suit. (laughs) It's funny. Let's translate this to everyday work because I have friends, you have friends that uh, are, you're hearing about them showing up at Zoom meetings and people aren't brushing their hair. They're, they're wearing something incredibly casual, you know, the, the sweatpants look. And I remember talking to one friend just last week saying that uh, you really do judge people differently when they don't seem to be taking the work as seriously. I think maybe we need a wake up call that this is still work, even though we're all working from home. Right. I mean, like I said, it's part of communication. So if you're showing up in your pajamas or with your hair in a messy bun or something, you're communicating something. And what is that? Probably I'm not taking this as seriously as I do in the office. And it's not worth it to me to dress up for you. And I say that as I am wearing a t-shirt and <laughs> well, capris. This is Suzanne, the Stacking Benjamin show. So you're right, drinking. It is, it is very casual <laughs> and it is a podcast. So no one can see me, but I did shower and I brushed my teeth. And because I've been in quarantine for a long time, I have inch long gray roots on my hair. Cause I'm one of those vain old women that <laughs> dye my hair. There you go. When, that, why is it though? <laughs> why is it though that, uh, in my opinion, and tell me if this is true, you think with most companies, it seems to me okay right now to have kids run around the background. Like as long as you leave it on mute, I think we all think that's okay. Even though not dressing for the occasions, not. I think the difference is with the kids is that we can't do anything else with the kids right now. My kids are older. They're 12 and 16. So they're perfectly capable of taking care of themselves. But by golly, they keep appearing when I'm on video conferences. And depending on what I'm doing, to be honest, I didn't warn them to stay away for this conversation because I know that you're going to love me anyway, and it's a podcast, so nobody's going to see them, but I have to warn them or they will not be able to take the hint of (laughs) stay away, mom is working. And when you've got little kids, I can't imagine doing this with toddlers or babies. I mean, I can't imagine trying to juggle all of this with little tiny kids. So I think people are much more forgiving of the little kids because you can't send them to daycare. You can't send them to grandma's. And if your spouse is also there, your spouse is working too. So somebody's, you know, Netflix is a great babysitter, (laughs) but there's only so much Netflix your two-year-old will tolerate. So I think people are more, into that. And I don't think anybody cares if you're not wearing, if if it's an internal meeting, you know, if you're casually dressed, if you're in your t-shirt, but it's when you're in your pajamas and you clearly haven't showered or you're in your bed or whatever. I mean, you can actually do a video conference from your bed. You just have to angle the camera, right? Not that I would ever do that, (laughs) but I hear it's possible. You heard a rumor. I heard a rumor. Wild rumor. It's possible. Well, I think we need to remember what you said about uh, children because we've also seen these uh, videos of parents just blowing up at their kids because they ran around in the background. And I think that if you're the kind of parent that might do that, I think worse of you that you blew up at your kid in the background than just us realizing that this is the condition right now. Yeah. And 
I don't want anybody to blow up at their kid, but I also want to recognize for everybody, this is not normal. This is so not normal. I first started working at home when my 16 year old was a baby and I did eventually go back into the office, but then I've been home exclusively for the past 11 years. Um, so I have a lot of work at home experience, but I had daycare and I had a nanny, you know, and this is not that. <laughs> this is not that. There is no nanny, you know, it just, you, you can't have one right now. Um, and although I did read an article about the poor rich people in New York who are suffering because their nannies can't stay and their maids can't stay. So they had to figure out how to clean the bathrooms and how to change diapers for the first time in their lives. And I cried. I it's cried, a, Joe. It's so a, sad. It, it, but it's a life lesson, Suzanne. It's, it's a life lesson. It is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will link to this piece, by the way, from Inc. A judge's request highlights why you need a telecommuting dress code. Just because employees work remotely, it doesn't mean you don't need a dress code. This is still business. Last question for you, Suzanne. What we're going through right now, though, you've been in HR and covering human resources for a long time. Does this change the game permanently for the way we work? Yep. We're never going back. One of the most important things from a legal standpoint, is the Americans with Disabilities Act. The Americans with Disabilities Act says that you have to give reasonable accommodations to someone that has a disability of, of some sort. Many people have argued that working from home is a reasonable accommodation, and many businesses have said no, because you can't do this job from home. Now, when we've had this time period of a month, two months, three months, let's see what it is, where people have been successfully working from home, never again will a business be able to go back to any of these jobs that people were able to do from home during this shutdown and say, no, it's not reasonable because we can point back and say, ah, but we did it from home for three months. So why is it no longer reasonable? And that's going to be a huge game changer in the terms of disability law. And then everything else is also changing. One of my favorite things, and I have been on like 47 podcasts to discuss this, but I'm going to say the same joke with every one of them, <laughs> is I saw this thing that said, who's leading your digital transformation? And the options were A, the CEO, B, the COO, and C, COVID-19. And it really is this COVID-19. All of a sudden, we had to transform. Business has changed forever. And you know what else has changed forever? Education. Education is never going back. I was thinking no more snow days. That's the saddest thing I've ever heard. Isn't that? I, I, I loved snow days. I thought snow days were my best friend and they are gone, I think, forever. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a possibility that you're right. I mean, getting the infrastructure and getting it all set up to do one day, probably not worth it. But but yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. it's never going back. What a wild world. Suzanne, thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes. Anytime. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And you know, Joe's mom and I have been extolling the virtues of Coca-Cola while these guys yak on about real estate and Zoom calls. Did you know Coca-Cola is fantastic to clean corrosion off your batteries? And it's delicious, both before and after. Plus, if you're looking for your daily sugar allotment, Coca-Cola's got you covered. Anything you can clean your pipes with and rid your stomach of worms has got to be healthy, right? Joe's mom recommends taking a little of that fizz out by adding whiskey, so I'm totally going to try that. But first, I'm going to share today's trivia question. Try this one on. Uh, uh, how many carbonated soft drinks per capita do Americans consume in a year? I'll be back with the answer in my own Coca-Cola and whiskey taste test in just a moment. Oh, I'm sure that's going to go well. That will be great. But, <laughs> but Felipe, you are playing on behalf of OG today. Uh, who has a much deserved day off. That means that you are in the lead. For those of you new to the show, we play this trivia every week and we have a year long competition for a fabulous prize at the end of the year. And OG has six, Len has five and Paula has four, which means Paula on this uh, annual servings of carbonated soft drinks. Do you want to go first in the middle or last? 
I will guess last. All right. Len, you want to go in the middle or you want to take it away? The middle, please. Who knew? Which means, Felipe, mm, you. you get to throw the first dart, my friend. Uh, I don't know. Uh, let's go with 7,300. This is uh, This is each person. Each person. Yes. This is per capita, per year. Oh, God. One person, uh, one year. One person, one year. Yep. I'm shooting in the dark here. 20? 20. Len? He's doing math I'm over doing, there. I got my calculator <laughs> out here. So, <laughs> so per cap, per person, you know, let's, uh, this is really wild. <sighs> per year, well, 356 days in a year. And let's just say, I'm going to say, boy, this seems a lot. I'm going to do it, though. I'm going to say 1.5 times that. 534 soft drinks a year. So you think the average person has a, a can and a half of Coke a day? Yes. Right. Hey, there's big gulps. See, I'm saying, like, you know, you have those super big gulps, those 64, right? What, what's a, you know, when you're saying a drink, I'm assuming it's a 16 ounce, right? So if somebody's having a big gulp, I know, I, I have a coworker. He comes in with a super big gulp every morning. I can't, why, every morning. Why, why does anybody need more than a big gulp? Like, I don't need to pee that bad. Do you remember how 7-Eleven started? First, it was just the right. large soda. Then it was the, <laughs> the big gulp. Then it was the super big gulp. And then it's the mega big gulp. Right. Right. They have the 128 ounce soda now you can get. Then they bring a hose over and they fill up your car with it. Yes. So anyways, I think you're, I, I assume they're going with a 16 ounce drink. I'm uh, guessing. That's, so, you know, that accounts for, if somebody's having a super big gulp, that's two or three right there. That's the case. Well, Paula, a lot of difference between 20 and 534. Yeah. Okay. So my thinking is you've got the segments of the population that don't drink soda at all. Chil maybe some children, some elderly people. They're just people who don't drink it at all. That's going to skew the average down. But then of the people who drink it, there's probably a significant number of them who drink quite a lot of it, who do drink it every day. So fundamentally, the question that I need to answer, since since the game is judged by closest, is do I think it's closer to 20 or do I think it's closer to 500 and, uh, what, Len, what was it that you said? 500 and... 34. 34. <laughs> so... Which of the two do I think it's closer to? All right, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna guess five hundred and thirty-three. So you think it's less than five thirty-four? Yes, I think it's less than five thirty-four, but I do think it's a high number. All right. Well, I'd love to tell you what the answer is, but of course, like any self-respecting show, we're gonna make you wait. So we'll By be... the way, let me just say as a coach, I gave up Coke for Lent this year. Congratulations. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then wait, wait. And you gave up Coca Cola? <laughs> Bonjour. Welcome to French Made Easy with me, your host, Mathilde. Today, I'm joined by certified financial planner Devin Carroll, and together we will share a popular and simple French phrase so you too can use it in your own life. Sound easy? Sure. Today's phrase is Mutual funds with high fees make me uncomfortable, Larry. In French, you would say this popular phrase just like this. Larry, les fonds de placement avec des frais élevés me mettent mal à l'aise. Once again, Larry, les fonds de placement avec des frais élevés me mettent mal à l'aise. Now, let's hear certified financial planner Devin Carroll try it. Ready, Devin? Okay. Fonds communes de placement, Larry avec des honoraires, élevés me font mal à l'aise. Ugh, nailed it. Perfect. See how we sound almost exactly alike? You two can speak French easily and comfortably listening to Stacking Benjamins. See you next time. Au revoir. All right, Felipe, it appears that uh, Paula and Len think you might be a little light there at 20. 
However, I'm hoping I'm hoping that people aren't drinking, you know, on average, a Coke and a half or two a day. Well, and and to your credit, you still have into the low 200s. So you've you've got a lot of breathing room here. That's true. I forgot about that. Yes. Yes. And then, Paula, you're low to mid 200s up to 533. Yeah, exactly. I've I've captured a pretty wide range. Yes. And Len, if they're guzzling the stuff, it's all you, brother. <laughs> oh, I hope my uh, my colleague at work who comes in every day with that big gulp, <laughs> super big gulp. That's uh, that's what most people do. We'll carry it for you. Well, Doug, uh, what's our answer, man? Hey there, trivia nerds. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And Joe's mom's right. Jack Daniels added to Coca-Cola. Yeah, it, could, it could catch on. Not only does it take out some of the bubbles, I found I sing better, too. <laughs> check, check this out. I've been working on the railroad all the live long day. <laughs> Everybody's just so nice. Everybody's really nice. Nice people. <laughs> well, here's your trivia answer. Check the question out one more time. So good. That was just so good. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Your trivia answer. Yeah. Uh, according to statistics online at a site called statistic.com, Mexicans actually drink the most carbonated beverages per capita at a rate of six, six per year. Oh, sorry. That that's uh, 632 per year. <laughs> my, my bad. <laughs> Uh, but our question was about the USA, right? So, I mean, who cares about how many other people are drinking in other countries because we care about the good old USA, which had a uh, nearly identical number at 625. 625. The biggest winner in all of that? Yeah, Coca-Cola, of course. Wow, I love that. What a great answer. I got to say, this is a really fun trivia question. Not only was Coca-Cola created on today's date back in 1886, but because so many people drink it, uh, back in 2018, that their brand value was like $70 billion. So wait, like it's, it's healthy, it's a fantastic battery cleaning agent, and now old Doug's going to show the neighborhood kids how great it is uh, to help you burp. They're going to love that lesson. That's life skill right there that they're just going to be able to take with them on about their way, uh, making the world better. Don't worry, I'll be six feet away when I'm teaching them how to burp. <laughs> They'll, they'll be able to hear me from the backyard. See ya. Yes. Wow. Six hundred and twenty-five. That is a lot when you consider again that so many people don't drink it at all. So the people who are drinking it are, are drinking, drinking a lot. Yeah, that's scary. <laughs> Yeah. Now you, know, now you know why diabetes is so, so high. Yeah. <laughs> Incidences of that. Yeah. F Felipe, with a guess like 20, you must be in Paula's group that uh, doesn't go near the stuff. <laughs> Look, I'm just hoping that it gets better. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Me too. I, I don't drink it. But Paula, how many Coca Colas have you had like last month? I, I maybe had one carbonated drink in the last month. In the last month, zero. zero. And granted, I had coronavirus, so the last <laughs> month is different than normal. Are you going to keep using coronavirus as your excuse for everything? <laughs> but even in a in a typical in a non coronavirus month, I still rarely drink it. Very rarely, maybe once once or twice a month. Well, maybe next we'll hear that Coca Cola cures coronavirus. Maybe that'll be the next. <laughs> Who knows? Hey, guys, let's take out the magnifying glass and help somebody do better with their money. Today's hotline call comes to us courtesy of magnifymoney.com. Felipe, you know what happens when you go to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money? Tell me. You find out that those financial products you use at a brick and mortar bank, probably not best in class. They rate right. over 92% of the products available online, whether it's checking accounts, savings accounts, credit card reward programs, balance transfers, 0% cards, uh, student loans, Whatever it is, stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. Today, we're going to help Scott magnify his money. Say hi, Scott. Hey, Joe and OG. This is Scott calling from Indianapolis. Long time, no talk. So I've been wondering with the whole global pandemic and economic downturn, 
I'm wondering if the old rule of thumb of having three to six months of an emergency fund is no longer valid. Has the paradigm shifted? Is a nine or even 12 month emergency fund now the new measuring stick upon which we measure financial security? Interested in your thoughts? Thanks. Stay safe. Wash your hands and don't touch your face. Scott is a longtime listener of the show, and I know that Scott's a, a doctor. And Scott, back at you, man. Uh, Scott probably comes around uh, the virus far more than I do here in mom's basement. Hold up. So thanks for the question, Scott. Felipe is the guest. Let's start with you. Are you thinking more money in cash now is a is a better place to be, especially with maybe the instability of renters or that income stream? I would say that securing long-term debt right now is very important. Cash is very important. You can't eat without it, right? Obviously, I don't think that I would be hoarding a ton of cash right now. I would be securing my long-term debt, opening up a line of credit and paying things. In, during the pandemic, I would not be paying for things with cash. I would be paying things with the line of credit or a credit card and then paying those minimum payments for now, calling my credit card company, seeing if I can have a zero interest payments just for right now during this time. And then once we get to the other side of it, then paying off that debt, obviously not over leveraging yourself. And that might be a little naive. I, I don't know. I, I definitely uh, am really interested to see what Paul is going to say. But I think for me, that's what I'm doing. I'm securing long-term debt, refinancing all my bad debt. And uh, do I have cash? Yeah, absolutely. But having open lines of credit, you know, I think those are really strong and positive right now as well. Well, I like Felipe going to long-term debt because obviously then your payments are lower too. So then if things get really bad for you, then your monthly overhead's not as high. Correct. Yeah. Do you worry about like what happened in 2007, 2008, though, if you go with just credit? Because we saw very quickly banks, uh, you know, if we end up going that way, banks ended up cutting credit lines very quickly. Use it while you can. Yeah, exactly. So um, if you can open up a line of credit, I would take take it all out and have the cash or have it available. And if it's in your contract, I mean, you. So what happened in 07 and 08 that I learned from my banks was that they could cancel it at any time. See, the Federal Reserve definitely cut that out. Banks can't shut down line of credit now just because they want to, um, which is why they have to go through the, the heavy process that they go through now, making sure you go through a closing company, paying your closing costs, et cetera. They can't just close lines of credit now without you messing up. Now, if you have a payment that you missed or if you're not on your P's and Q's about your lines of credit, then yeah, you might be able to fall in trouble. And then you gave the ball to their court anyways. But if you're fiscally responsible with your line of credit and your open credit cards and you're paying, there should be no reason for them to close it because at the end of the day, they make their money off the interest anyways. Len, I will just bet before you tackle this that uh, you prefer gold bullion to, to dollar bills. <laughs> yes, I do, actually. But that's for that's for the big thing. That's not for emergency funds, so to speak. That's for long-term savings. Sure. But, but uh, the thing for me with the line of credit is the, the thing I worry about, and maybe it's, you know, cause I, is, is jobs. And what if you lose your job? And then what? I, personally, I'd rather be... I'm with Scott. I, I I say, yes, up your cash holdings to nine or 12 months. Personally, I think that's what I would do because there's just so much uncertainty out there. There's 22 million plus people out of work right now, and I think it's only going to get worse in the near term. And it's just um, if you can save as much cash as you can, save it up because you don't know how long you're going to be out of work. Is this an issue of both, though? Do you also like what Felipe is saying, making sure you've got open lines of credit if you have to run to those, Len? Oh, yeah, certainly. Well, hey, look at all the big corporations right now. They've had all their revolvers. They're using them all up. They, yeah. They've taken all their, their line. I mean, they took every every last penny from their revolvers right now. You know, if I was a gambling man, I'd, I'd do what Felipe said. I'd do that. Or if I was really a gambler, if I really thought everything was going to go to crap, I, I'm not recommending this, folks. This is gambling, total gambling. Don't do it. Put it all on a credit card if you think the whole credit industry is going to blow up because that is very possible. I mean, the credit is in trouble right now. So, but don't do that. That's a total gamble. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, that would be if if I if you're wrong, that's going to be very painful. Because if it goes the other you way, an idea, and then tell you not to use. It. <laughs> right. It's a, just. Just charge up those credit cards. It's a non-recourse loan, but, uh, you know, don't do that. Charge up the credit cards, Paula. Head for Vegas. <laughs> Put it all on black. 
see where it goes. I bet that's what you're going to say, isn't it? Something like that. So what I was going to say, in terms of how big should your emergency fund be, in part, especially during this pandemic, the answer is going to depend on, number one, how stable and secure is your job? What is your likelihood of having your hours cut or your hours furloughed? And number two, are you dual income or single income? Because if you are a, a one income family or if you're single, then you are in a more vulnerable position than somebody who's part of a dual income household who has their spouse's income that they can fall back on in the event that they lose theirs. So as long as as long as they haven't spent up to their two incomes, right, Paula? I mean, a lot of people right. are two income and they they spend all of that income. They have no discretionary left. Right, right, right. But but at least you've you've diversified your income streams, right? If you've got two people's incomes, your household income is not going to drop to zero. Whereas if you're single or if you're a one income household, your household income drops to zero. It's like, uh, you know, it goes from 100 percent to zero percent overnight. And that's a huge risk. And so depending on those two factors, the likelihood of your industry, your job, cutting your hours and also whether you're single income or dual income, I would say everybody needs a minimum three to six month emergency fund. And if you are in a more vulnerable position due to your job or your household arrangement, then I would go to between six to nine months. And Uh, I would have no objection if people wanted to even save up a year. I think that's totally fine. And if you have business, if, if you yourself run a business, if you're a small business owner, I think having a year's worth of cash reserves for your business so that you can make payroll, pay your employees um, is a very, very good idea. So 12 months for your business, six to nine months for your personal life. Unless you're uh, an airline. Really, three to nine. Unless you're an airline, Paula, then you just wait and and the government, no. Yeah, right, <laughs> buy you out. <laughs> <laughs> Felipe? Can I, can I mention something there, man? I, I really want to explain a little bit more of myself and what? So my, the way I invest is I use credit to buy my investment properties, depreciating assets or depreciating anything I use cash for. During this time of coronavirus, I would not be using my cash. I would be using credit because we don't know where it's going and you want to have, you want to be able to pay that minimum payment while on a credit card or on a line of credit while you can still buy food and things like that. Now, if we were on the other side of this pandemic, then I would actually say, you know, reverse that. If you're going to buy a car that's going to depreciate in value, use your cash because cash is also depreciating. If you're going to buy an asset, then use credit. I guess that's just what I was saying. You know, I, I, I definitely agree with Paula. Have three to six months cash in reserve. But I just personally think that right now is not the time that you're going to go out and buy all your food on cash. I would use my credit first and then my cash because we don't know how long this is going to last. Well, and and the other thing, the other point you make when you say minimum payments as well is that, yeah, you're hoarding cash as long as you possibly can. Exactly. I'm not saying run out and pay off your credit card because then you're just paying the man. Right now, you need to be very careful what payments you are doing. I would not be running to pay my Netflix account. I would be running to make sure my family has food right now. You know, so making sure that you're you're using your funds to make sure that you're maximizing your life right now. Netflix is not as important as eating right now, if that makes I, sense. I don't know, man. It depends on how good Tiger King season two gets. <laughs> my wife might say the same thing <laughs> well that's gonna do it for today hey scott big thanks for the question and uh stay safe my friend and if you've got a question for us head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail and uh that's where you'll find us all right let's uh, give our guest of honor here the last word uh len we'll start with you what's happening over at that crazily titled lenpenzo.com Yes, at uh, the persistentitch.com this week, uh, somebody asked me f- to summarize my personal finance playbook. And so I put together this manifesto of things I've learned uh, at the School of Hard Knocks re- with respect to personal finances. So I came up with 38 of these little sound bites, really uh, personal wisdom I've accrued over my. Oh, I'm in 29 years. Did I say four decades? 29 years of, of living. So. <laughs> Over to, over so, the, over no, but, the t- but uh, so, uh, I thought, uh, you know, I thought hard about it. And I, I think I came up with 38 really good things. So come on by and check them out. That's awesome. And that is at lenpenzo.com. Paula, what's happening at the Afford Anything podcast? On the Afford Anything podcast, we have an interview with Dr. Sarah Stanley Falla. She is a researcher who researches the the psychology of money. 
Um, she's the author of the book, The Next Millionaire Next Door, and she's the daughter of one of the co-authors of The Millionaire Next Door. So we're going to be talking all about the pandemic, the current economic situation, and how to navigate all of that. Ma'am, Felipe, thanks for coming and saving the show. Did my best. <laughs> Uh, tell everybody what's coming up on Real Estate Rookie, because I love I love the fact that even here early on, you guys, as of the time that we're recording this, have uh, seven episodes people can go back and listen to, so probably nine or ten now. But uh, what's coming up on the show? Some of the things that's going to be coming up is how rookies are investing during the corona time. Um, you know, are, are they still taking action? What are they doing to continue to invest in real estate? What are they doing with their debt? How are they refinancing and things like that? One of the biggest things that you're going to get out of this show is going to be mindset. We're bringing on a lot of guests that have the right mindset and are showing others how to get in the right mindset during this time. Awesome. And you'll find that that's real estate rookie. And actually, if people are part of the bigger pockets community, they'll see your show all over the place there too. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. You got to put up with those horrible people like Brandon and David and Scott and Mindy. I feel bad for I love you. Them all. They're awesome people. <laughs> They're <laughs> they, great. They are. They're some of my favorite people. All right. Uh, we'll have all the links to Felipe's show, Paula's show, Len's blog on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. Doug, you got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? So, what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our round table. Find great mentors and listen. Don't try and reinvent the wheel. It's not worth it. It's just, it's just don't, you don't try to reinvent it. Unless you're having uh, the non-fizzy Jack Daniels and, and Coke, you can reinvent that. But uh, Second, take a lesson from the evil HR lady, Suzanne Lucas. Just because you're working from home, that doesn't mean you should neglect how you're dressed for your video conference calls. You're on video, people. I mean, everybody's watching. But the big, 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 big takeaway, Joe's mom just mentioned that some guy named w w Warren Buffet owns a ton of Coca-Cola stock, like a ton. Makes sense. Uh, if Coca-Cola is good enough for Warren's Buffet, it's good enough for us here in the basement. We'd like to thank Felipe Mejia for coming to the basement and sharing his knowledge with us. You can find more about Felipe's show, Re Real Estate Rookie, wherever podcasts are distributed, or on YouTube under Felipe Mejia, or also on our show notes page at the place where we put our show notes. Oh, and speaking of buffets... Are we ever going to see one of those again? I mean, like, they're just they're gone. I'm going to miss reaching out under that sneeze guard to grab a handful of chicken nuggets. Just as many as you want. You can just get them all, especially the ones that that kid in front of me put back. He put back all the best ones. Oh, and also we should thank um, uh, Suzanne Lucas for sharing her knowledge on how this crisis is going to change the way people work and do other business stuff you can find her at the evil hr lady.org right there at the, the evil hr lady oh that's hard to say i think i had too much uh, non-fizzy coke joe paula pant appears courtesy of afford anything.com and afford anything podcast all the afford anythings Len Penzo appears courtesy of LenPenzo.com and TheAngelOfDarkness.com. This show is created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rudder Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I do not like computer jokes, not one bit. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor.
Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. What uh, happens here, Felipe stays here. We don't talk about this. I found this, this thing on an entrepreneurial website about these crazy inventions people came up with. And all three of you are business owners. And I thought that you guys would know a good invention if you saw it. So why don't we, why don't we walk through these and a few of these, these are 11 crazy business ideas. We're probably not going to do 11, but I thought we'd take a few of these. So, so the first one is called the firefighter. And it says here that it's a, it's a urinal with tiny flames in it that you got to put out. This guy writes boredom during the usual uh, going to the bathroom is finally a thing of the past. With the all-new firefighter, tiny flames inside the bowl of the urinal stay lit until patrons extinguish them. Upon flushing, the bowl relights itself for the next gentleman. As an added bonus, the ambient light from the urinal can act as mood lighting for any dimly lit restroom. <laughs> Felipe, are you investing in that? I am so investing in that. That is a winner. It'll keep me going for ages. Definitely going to buy. <laughs> Len, you like that company? You investing in that idea? You know, I do, and, and I've seen similar things. I've seen the uh, the dartboard in the in the urinal. Have you seen that where you can score points? And I've seen the fly. You got to hit the fly. It has the fly in the bottom there. <laughs> I was thinking the fly just painted on the back is so much. I mean, think about all of the fuel cost for the for the urinals. That would be. Paula, would this work for women? You just kind of move around and see if you no. can. No, I think you have to be able to pee standing up to be able to make this work. But they do sell funnels that uh, can facilitate that. There. So so this can pair nicely with a pee funnel. And then you investing in it? If, if somebody gets the pee funnel, you invest in it then? You know, I wouldn't invest in the company. I just don't see this being a big seller. But I, I would certainly <laughs> uh, I would certainly tweet about it. I would certainly. <laughs> These guys. These guys uh, said no, because basically because it could be a fire hazard. They said yeah. probably that. <laughs> <laughs> the second creative idea here, a website that shows you the first 10 to 12 minutes of any movie in the world. The person wrote, most people make up their mind to continue watching or not within that time frame. If the producers know what they're doing, any spoilers revealed within the first 10 to 12 minutes are not real spoilers. What do you think, Paula, a website that just shows you the first 10 minutes of a movie? Uh, no, I'm not not a big fan of it. There's there's already so much oversaturation in terms of movie review sites and movie this and that and the other. And there's movie bloggers and movie critics. And there's there's so many ways to determine what movies you want to watch. Even just reading the reviews on the platforms that host the movie. I just don't see this taking off. But Felipe, do you watch many movies? I do. I do. I actually love watching. See, Paula doesn't watch any movies, so I probably shouldn't have gone to her. For, she's like, this. One, she doesn't even know who Darth Vader is. So, <laughs> oh, oh, man. We got that. But, 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 so as a guy that watches movies, then think about the time savings that is, Felipe. I mean, 15 to 20 minutes, and you can decide if you're in or out. Do you like it? No, hate it. I'd be upset. I'd want to watch the whole thing then and there. <laughs> either, either way. Len? Yeah, you know, I like it because, you know, what I, you can't rely on those ratings because, um, you know, I, I like Nick Cage movies, you know, and whenever I see the ratings, they're always a half star, or one star. I, and every movie I see is they're five stars to me, but the ratings are always one star, or half star. Yeah, I would definitely do this. Just just to, I mean, there have been a few clunker Nick Cage movies, but not many. I still think but, Nash, National Treasure is just such a great movie. What a campy oh, fun a movie. Oh, that's, yeah, those are really good. But you had to get into the really obscure ones. I mean, he, he does some really, really obscure stuff. <laughs> but, okay, think of it this way. So let's say each of these previews are 15 minutes long. If you watch four of them to determine which movie you want to watch, that's an hour. That's half the length of a movie. So you're not saving any time. Well, well the first one's good, though. You, you don't even need to see the other three, right? Well, good point. Uh, last one I have here. As uh, since this is a podcast, what do you guys think about Twitter for audio or like audio vine? Somebody says, I can see this happen, uh, but like vine, will people stay with it during the long run? Like if you could just sample, if you could stay a sample, the real estate rookie podcast, if you had like a vine of it, Felipe, good idea. I think it'd be a great idea, actually. 
I think it would be two. I really, but I really do. I think Paula, I don't know if, because you've been podcasting for quite a while. I've seen some of these come and go and nobody ever, nobody ever pays attention. I always thought it's a pretty good idea. You can just sample it. Yeah. Yeah. I think short snippets of podcasts, having a social media platform based around that. But yeah. I, I could see people, listen, podcast enthusiasts listening to that. So why hasn't it taken off yet? You know, there are so many, there's social media platforms out there. So many attempts at creating the next Instagram that every coder wants to do. I think it's just a very tough market. It's a tough market to stand out in. Len, would you listen to something like that? Like a Twitter for podcasts? Uh, I'm not so sure. I, maybe. You know, here, here's my recommendation, Joe, is, is why don't we try it out right now? Why don't we each get a quick uh, audio, uh, do a Vine? <laughs> each of us, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think just what I need is more can work. <laughs> That's exactly what I need. If I could get more work on it. Pass. <laughs>